Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Everyone that answers said they're good, so we'll take that. Hey, uh, glad to be with you and excited to be gathered in worship this morning and thankful, uh, uh, especially for that last song. I felt that was really uh, thankful. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, hey, a couple quick things before we jump in. Uh, one is I just want to remind you once again uh, for half of our room, uh, ladies, is uh, please register for the IF Gathering coming up this weekend. Uh, excited. I, I've had, uh, I've, I've never been at a church that's done this, uh, but I have friends that uh, hosted at their churches uh, and always come back with incredible, uh, not, not just reports and reviews of how it went, uh, but really just what God does in those moments. So would encourage you, uh, if you've not yet registered, please do that. To my understanding, you can still show up. You just won't get a lunch. Is that correct? All right. So if I were you, I'd register. Uh, but uh, uh, make sure you're there for that. Also, at the end of this month, we'll be having another membership class. Uh, and so for those of you uh, who've been around here uh, for some period of time and are trying to figure out, uh, is, is this home? Uh, or is this my family? Are these my people? Uh, is this where we can uh, put in our spiritual roots uh, in, into this soil with these people in this house and this family? Uh, we'd uh, encourage you to sign up for that, register for that, and make sure that you attend uh, and, and hear about what's going on at Moraine Valley, who we are, what we do, and how you can be a part of that. So uh, let, me, let me jump in uh, to uh, this section. Uh, I, I will say this, I, sometimes I forget at the beginning, we, we are taking communion together at the end of service. Uh, so if you don't yet have communion, uh, there are trays around on our, uh, the, the brick wall around here. So if you, uh, if you get really bored in the middle of my message and you need something to do, you can go grab communion. So, um, but, uh, but hey, as, as we jump in here, we are really continuing in what we've started two months ago. Uh, two months ago, we started a journey walking through, the, um, walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And in this, <clears throat> really looking for uh, Jesus' longest teaching uh, that we have recorded and, and finding in that, uh, what is this message? What does Jesus call us to? What does it mean to be the kinds of people that Jesus is calling us to be? Doing the kinds of things that Jesus is calling us to do? And to whom do we do those things? Uh, how do we live this out? What does it look like to be uh, who God's called us to be? And in this, uh, uh, we started two months ago with, uh, I gave this story, a, a guy who's a pastor on the west side of Chicago heard his story of uh, teaching this class, and, and it was uh, to a church, I'm assuming probably demographic-wise, about the same as Moraine Valley, people who had been around the church for a while, uh, had been in the, in the Word, knew it pretty well, and, and was leading a class on the Sermon on the Mount. And the first week of class, he stood up and he read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. At the end of it, he asked the class, how many of you think Jesus was serious? That this is who we're supposed to be. This is how we're supposed to be. These are the things we're called to do. These are the things we're called to give up or release. These are the things that we are supposed to take hold of. Uh, this is the stuff in our lives that are to be laid bare and transparent and, and laid before God and say, Lord, have your way. And that his way would be what fills us up and who we become and not a single person in the class raised their hand. And the assumption was, was that there are some things in here, well, it's too hard. It would be impossible to fully live that out. Uh, for some, they kind of disagreed with where Jesus landed on things. In some, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount uh, felt like he must, it must be exaggeration because there's no way we're really called to live this way. Uh, and I would ask us to answer the same question, not by a show of hands, but just for yourself. Uh, as we look at Jesus' words, uh, he, he shows up to earth to become like us, spends a few short years walking with people, discipling them shaping them, molding them to become the people God's called them to be, to release them, to do what God's called them to do, do you think he was serious? And if so, we enter into the Sermon on the Mount with a different mindset. We walk in with a different frame of mind. We have to enter into this saying, Lord, have your way. If my life is not aligned with this, would you please take whatever's holding me back 
And would you please give me whatever I need to move forward? In a lot of ways, we're praying that prayer that maybe you grew up singing, Lord, bind my wandering heart to thee. God, don't let me drift one way or the other. Hold me and attach me to who you are and what you're doing. And I found in my own life, as I was reviewing kind of the church upbringing I had, is uh, we spent a lot of time in Paul's letters and not a lot of time in Jesus' words. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not throwing out Paul's letters. I'm for them, just so we're all on the same page. But to go back to the Christ in whom Paul was writing about and reading who he was and what he said and how he expected his followers to live, what was he shaping in them when they were traveling around? What were the messages he was giving them? What was his expectations for his disciples? And are we those people? Are we becoming those people? Are we yielding our lives to be more and more like him? I would like, if we could, just to stand as we read the word of the Lord. We're going to pick up where we've left off the last couple months as we read Matthew's chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Fathers, we enter into this word. Would you speak to us? God, would you give us the same sense of uh, heaviness of this message that the disciples would have heard when they first heard this out of Jesus' mouth? Father, would you give us the same strong foundational sense of identity and who we're called to be? Uh, Lord, would you shape us and mold us so that we can adhere who we are to the lives that you've called us to live? Uh, Father, would we be open to repent where our lives are out of a line with your word? Father, would we be corrected? Uh, Lord, would you call out of us the things that aren't in alignment with this? Uh, Lord, would you, would you train in us? Would you develop in us? Would you shape in us? The kinds of things that we need to do to live into righteousness. Father, would you, would, would you, would you send us out and lead us forward? Through your word and by your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. In this passage, uh, I, I grew up with uh, knowing that there were just people around us. Uh, and I, I grew up, uh, you know, I, I know Chicago claims Midwest, but until you're from like rural Midwest, you don't know Midwest. And I didn't grow up in rural Midwest, I grew up in Springfield downstate. Uh, and there was a sector of society uh, who was gracefully called salt of the earth people. You know what I'm talking about. People that were just the good ones. Uh, the ones who everywhere they went, uh, they felt like they were adding more than what they were taking away. You've been around people that sometimes can be cranky and angry. You hear their opinions more than you hear their love, right? Right? people who uh, have a tendency to kind of uh, take life out of the room rather than give life into it, and grew up with these people being called salt-of-the-earth people. Jesus here opens up this section. I wouldn't say opens it up. He transitions or leads into, out of another section of his teaching, by reminding us of who we are. It's important for us as we jump into this to know who we are. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, and that's where we're going to be couching our time together, says this, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. Uh, sometimes when we read this, uh, Pete, if you could keep that passage up as we talk through it, 
Uh, sometimes as we're reading through this, uh, it's hard to grab onto some of the nuances. One of those is this, the first word, you. And we can think it's personal, but as you read through it in the languages, what you find is this. Uh, if you are from the South, uh, this is you plural, so it would be y'all, which still grinds in my gears when I hear it, right? Technically, because of the way it's written, it would be all y'all, which now you know you don't get out of it, right? But in Chicago, the Lord's language, we would say, use guys, all right? <laughs> So Jesus leads in talking about you guys or all y'all or us, his people, his followers, his disciples, the ones who have left everything to follow him. While others are listening, Jesus is teaching his disciples, the one who have left everything to follow him, to be with him, to become transformed by him and to do what he does. He's not giving a heartfelt lesson to the world at large. No, this is for rooms like this. He's speaking something very specific into the lives of his disciples. And something we've mentioned in, in months past is something just to bring up is uh, it's, uh, we, we live in a time uh, in the church where we can claim to be Christians but still not be followers of Jesus. And in this, Jesus shatters any idea that that could even be possible. And he calls us to himself. And while we're with him, he trains and shapes in us who we're called to be. We aren't called to do Jesus-y type things. We are called to be like the teacher, to become like Christ. Now, obviously, there's some deity limitations to that. But that doesn't get us out of the human element of who we're called to be. And in this, what we find is that we're the salt of the earth. Now, in this then, the next question is, how are we salt? What does that even mean? What is the salt that we are? The only thing we have reference to so far in Jesus' teaching is what's already come before, is these Beatitudes. Think about it this, if you are an empty salt shaker, what gets filled in you are these, that uh, when we are salt, we are poor in spirit. It's those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, persecuted because of righteousness. After this section where Jesus takes us through what we call the Beatitudes, but these blessings for the good life, these are uh, the kinds of people who live in the good life of the kingdom. And as he works through this section and this passage, what he leads us into is being reminded, don't forget at the very end, he paints this uh, daunting picture that when you live this way, the world is going to return the favor. It's going to fire back. When you live like the kingdom, the world's going to live like its kingdom back at you. And at the end of that, he says, but rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. That it doesn't get us out of living like Christ because of how the world reacts, but because of how Jesus is, we are called to be like him no matter how the world reacts. And in a transition from that, he says, you, church, are the salt of the earth. But if you lose your taste or your saltiness, how in the world could we be made salty again? And then it talks not about what God does, but about what people do. It's tossed out and it's trampled underfoot. What John Stott calls road dust. It talks to the usefulness. It speaks to the quality and the value. I would make a case here that our Christian saltiness is our Christ-like character depicted in Matthew 5, verses 3 through 5, what we've, or 3 through 12, what we've called the good life or the Beatitudes. Our only hope at becoming these people is to lay down our lives and follow Jesus. How can we follow Jesus while living in the real world? That becomes the question. But what about when people do this? But what about when the world acts crazy? But what about when the world continues in its decay? What about when things around us, systems that were upheld that seem like they're crashing? What happens when things we used to be able to trust feel like we can't trust them anymore? Jesus reminds us, 
we can trust him. And here we find in Jesus' words that we're called to abandon all things and cling to him because how the world responds does not shape how we respond back. Rather, it calls us to continue to press forward and live out the life of Christ. Jesus has said that living this way would result in suffering at the hands of others, but this isn't a new section of teaching. It is a continuation coming out of the Beatitudes. Living into the good life of verses 3 through 11 will result in suffering and persecutions of verse 12. Jesus says to rejoice and be glad because we have a great reward in heaven. Then Jesus gives us these images of being salt and light, and both of them come with exhortations and warnings. There's this unbelievable teaching where Jesus lets us know who we are. And some of us, I don't know what your background is. I don't know where you come from. You look at who you are and you wonder how God could use anything like this. But then here you read Jesus' words. He says, you, what you bring to the earth is something invaluable. So what do you do with that? But in the middle of that, Jesus also gives us this warning and this exhortation of, and if you don't do that, what good is it? If you don't live into this, if this isn't who you are, and be mindful as Jesus is teaching this, what he's shaping in us is who we are results in what we do. And so it's not necessarily about the what we do part, though we start questioning if we aren't who we're called to be, then we're not going to do what we're called to do, but it starts in here. You are salt, not you have salt, or you can obtain salt, or if you work hard enough, you'll be better salt. You just are, because you've died to your old way of life. You've been buried with Christ, and you've risen to walk with him. That is our Christian story. Because of what Christ has done for us, we've been covered over and forgiven. And in that church, you are salt. But if we lose our saltiness, how can we be made salty again? Jonathan Pennington likens Jesus' teaching here about salt and light to a mama bird pushing out young birds to fly out of the nest. Poor in spirit, mourning, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You get filled up with what this life's going to be, but then all of a sudden it's the like, well, I like being in the nest better. It's easier here in church world than it is out there. I like arguing theology in my Bible study rather than loving my neighbor. Easier, isn't it? So the nest becomes way more comfortable. And he says, what Jesus says here is you are the salt of the what? So you got to go. The salt's got to go. It's got to come out. It's got to be out there. The salt needs to be where God's called us to be. We've just been given a vision of the kingdom of God's good life and warned that it will happen when you, what will happen when you live this way. But Jesus is calling us to go we can choose two alternative options. When Jesus is calling us to go, sometimes we slip back into one of these other two. One, church, take warning. We can become so much like the world around us that there is no distinction between who we are and who they are. And it's not that we're better than, but there's no distinction. The other option is that we just stay in the nest forfeiting maturity and ministry for the sake of security, safety, and control. It's easier in the nest. Or it's easier looking like everyone else. But Jesus says there's a distinction that you have, and there's a world that needs it. And he kicks us out of the nest. We're only 13 verses into the sermon, and he's already shoving us out. Jesus is calling us something. He's calling us away from something, and he's calling us to something. Calling us out of the world around us to be set apart, consecrated, holy, but also calling us out of our comfort and control to the world around us, because church, the people need Jesus. And sometimes we walk away from our calling to give him to them and just hope that it all works out and wonder why it doesn't. 
When Jesus calls his people to go and they don't, don't be surprised when the world that needs Jesus rarely gets him. I want us to look at this through a couple ways. For us to be salt of the earth, there's one thing we need to grab onto, and it's this. You are an influence for the world around you. Doesn't mean you're the key influence or that God has left the building because don't worry, church, you're here. But there is a way that the Lord often works, and it is through his people. That there's a way that when we do go out, he uses us to season the things around us, to flavor the things around us, maybe even to preserve what's decaying in the world around us. As Jesus was preaching the sermon, salt was used for so many things. We've found different ways of creating salt, using salt, and using it today. My guess is most of the reason you need an alignment right now has to do with salting in your car. You've gone to the car wash because there's salt everywhere, because we use it for things. There's a reason why you have to go to the store and buy salt, right? Because steak just doesn't taste as good without it. All right, I'll close out service and we'll do an altar. No. (laughs) In this time, salt was used as sacrifices on the altar given by Leviticus chapter two uh, when it said salt is a part of the sacrificial system, that it was a part of that moment. It would have been known for that. It, It gives seasoning the same way that we use it now. Salt enhances the flavor of everything that it's on. It's also used for preserving. It preserves and halts decay and things like meat. Because of its broad and everyday usefulness, it was also traded as currency. And we could sit and talk about which of these functions of salt Jesus was referring to, but maybe it's the fact that it has all these uses. Maybe it's the fact that salt is such a necessity of the world around us and the life that we live that that it needs to have it. And so in this, Salt is and was a substance that has so many uses, and every one of them, it influences and it enhances. It has some part to play in how it affects what it touches and what's going on around us. Just like salt has to stay salty, Jesus' followers, we have to remain in Christ and in our Christ-likeness. Not just privately in our walk, but publicly in our witness. Jesus goes in to painting the picture of what happens when we stop being who we actually are. And and, and think about this. In in a culture that is so uh, wrecked with things uh, like anxiety and depression, where pharmaceutical companies are making a lot of money off of our own fears and anxieties. When we step into passages like this, what we need to be reminded of is we see people around us. And the hardest part is this, right? Right? It's when you see something in people that they don't see in themselves. You know what I'm talking about? Someone who's struggling internally with who they are, what they have to offer, what God's called them to be, the giftedness that they have, the talent that God's put in them, and and all of that, the places where they are. And you could see for them what God could use them for and how he could make an unbelievable impact. But you know the issue. Is so long as they don't see it in themselves, it wrecks everything. Church, Jesus sees stuff in us. We are the salt of the earth. Not because we decided it, because Jesus told us. It carries divine weight because it comes from the messenger of the Messiah. And in this, if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. This word uh, that's used for become tasteless uh, is a weird translation because it's kind of a, 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 a phrase that was used in the original languages that doesn't translate well into our English. Literally translated, it just means made foolish. So if the salt is made foolish, how can it be made like salt again? Right? And of course, that is tricky. We don't know what to do with it. But it was a saying used by doctors and even comedians during that time and before the time of Jesus, ultimately meaning that if salt loses whatever makes it salt, how can it be made back to itself again? The NIV translates it well with, if the salt loses its saltiness. 
if what it actually is, is lost and it doesn't have that anymore. Here's the interesting part. Salt in and of itself does not lose its saltiness. It's just as salty a thousand years ago as what it is today. What makes it lose its saltiness is when there's impurities in the salt, other things that get in there to dilute it or to pollute it from being what it actually is. It's when that salt's got other things, so when you sprinkle it out, you're not really getting all salt. There's some sand in there. There's some deposits in there. There's some decay in there. There's some weird stuff that got mixed in because nobody did the work in there. Salt loses its influence and impact on other things when it's not purely salt and other stuff makes its way in. You get where we're going, church? Jesus brings our attention to our lives in the same way. If we stop being who we are, then what are we? If in our new life, we don't live into the calling and identity that Christ has given us. Mind you, your new life is only possible because of what we celebrated last week, that Jesus didn't stay dead. And so in our new lives, why don't we live a new life? You are salt. We are called to have a kingdom influence in the world around us and impact the world around us as ambassadors of Jesus. What happens if we stop being ambassadors with kingdom influence and impact to the world around us? If you're curious, look at the world around us and you'll see. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by who? By people. What it doesn't say is that God tosses you out and you're of no good to him. Don't read that in here. That's not the implication. But it does give us this reminder that for Christ's people to live like Christ, we add something. And they may persecute us, but we're adding something. But if Christ's people go out and we're not being who we're called to be, we have no use to anyone around us, right? We're not like them. We're not really like Jesus. We're not really like anything because we're trying to please everybody or make our own way forward and make the world just like us. And it doesn't work. The world wants you to conform to its patterns or be like the Lord that you claim to live under. And if we're anywhere else, it just doesn't fit. The world will throw out and trample underfoot by people. What happens when something or someone with so much use and value stops being what it genuinely is? Listen, this message we get from Jesus is we have the potential to either be good for everything, but we also run the risk of being good for nothing. And what I'd challenge us to think through is every time we complain about the decay of the world, wonder what would stop the decay? Could it possibly be salt? Could it possibly be Jesus' people who live like Christ in our neighborhoods and show people who he is? Could it be when our neighbors are struggling, but they've got Jesus that lives next door, not literally, but through his people as ambassadors, And we've got people who love them deeply and pray for them deeply and care for them deeply and walk with them deeply. And the world needs it. This is not about our value to God, but our use and value to the earth. It comes from our lives when Jesus is king over your life and the spirit is working within you to become more like him. When we abide in Jesus, we bring so much to everyone and everything around us. And when we don't, what do we bring? Second thing I want us to look at is this, salt of the earth, is our distinction is dependent on our holiness. The fact that we're set apart is what adds something different. Jesus uses this salt language in another another teaching recorded in Luke. He uses difficult language to remind us of who we need to be. Now, I know it's the first Sunday, so we got kids in the room, so hang with me. I promise we're going to end in a good spot because Jesus says this, a large crowds were gathered along with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, take it easy, and does not hate his own father, his own mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
How can you, right? Let's just take a look at it. How can you hate your parents, spouse, children, family, and your own life while also following Jesus' greatest command, which is to love our neighbors as ourselves? It's a common hyperbole or exaggeration in the original languages. It wasn't just used uh, by Jesus in scripture. It's used uh, culturally in Greek language and in this time. Listen to how the same teaching is recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. The one who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy worthy of me. You hear the nuances there. The issue isn't, do we literally hate our fathers and mothers, our own children, our own lives? Or is it that we've loved the people who matter most to us above how we matter him? It will change how you follow Christ if that's not in order. Oftentimes uh, it, during a wedding ceremony, if I get the honor of officiating, I will remind everybody, I don't know anyone who's ever been divorced because both of them tried so hard to live like Christ, right? Usually that's not the issue. In fact, it's the opposite. So in this, what I've learned, and this is just personal reflection from my own marriage, is when I live more like how I think it should go, Ray doesn't get a very good husband. Unfortunately, she's had to suffer through that. The more I yield my life to Christ, the more I exalt him over all things, the more that I've grown and matured and the spirit has led me to be able to love Jesus more has allowed me to be such a better husband to my wife. So in loving him more, I love Ray more. Does that make sense? My boys get a better father because I'm yielding to my father, right? And in this, what he's calling us to is not just, think about this, the distinction here is not who we hate, but rather to whom our allegiance is to. While Christ, while in Christ, we can see that we, all that we have to gain, the question becomes, have we really looked at our lives and evaluate everything we need to lose? Have we counted the cost? It's this section of scripture that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, early uh, 1900s German theologian, uh, named the title of his book of the Sermon on the Mount, The Cost of Discipleship. Have we counted the cost? Do we know what it's going to take? For which of you, in verse 28, when he wants to build a tower, does not sit down first and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who are watching it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this person began to build and was not able to finish. Right? Now, I'm notorious in the Kaufman house for starting a project and getting distracted by the next project. Or a basketball game, but whatever, right? Uh, what he does is Jesus exposes the ridicule and shame someone would endure, not on his own part, but on the part of the people around him who didn't count the cost, who stopped halfway into the project. You started, but you didn't finish. You thought this is going to be great, and then it got tough, or then something happened, or then God called you to leave something that you didn't want to, or he called you to go somewhere you didn't want to go, or he called you to stay somewhere you didn't want to stay. And then all of a sudden you think, I'm going to stop here, Well, that keeps going. We started, but we are not finishing. Verse 31, he gives an example of a king in war. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to face the one coming against him with 20,000? Otherwise, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and requests terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Whoa. He exposes the embarrassment and loss someone would endure who didn't count the cost. John Calvin, 
and commenting on this section of scripture says this, it would be absurd to insist on a literal interpretation of the phrase as if no man were a disciple of Christ until he threw into the sea all that he possessed, divorced his wife, bid farewell to his children. Therefore, the true self-denial which the Lord demands from his followers does not consist so much in outward conduct as in the affections. So that everyone must employ the time which is passing over him, pay attention, without allowing the objects which he directs by his hand to hold a place in his heart. It's a lordship issue. Is Jesus Lord? Is Christ over all, in all, and through all? The theological answer is yes. Your personal response is sometimes. Yes. Jesus is calling us to count the cost and follow him. And then after all that teaching, Jesus goes into this in verse 34. Therefore, salt is good. But even salt, even, but if so, even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or the manure pile. So it's thrown out. The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. What he even says is you got to be careful where you even throw it. You can't throw it into manure pile. It'll ruin the manure. Easy. Right? Take it down a notch, Jesus. We get it. But he doesn't. You can't just throw it in the soil. It'll mess up the soil. It literally becomes useless. Church, we are called to be salt. You died to your old way of life. You were offered forgiveness by Jesus' blood on a cross. You've been raised to life because Christ was resurrected. And in your new life, we get to be salt. Salt is distinct. It's different than what you are putting it on. That's why it adds so much. It enhances so much. And it changes so much. It is an outside agent applied to something different that affects, transforms, shapes, and alters whatever it touches. John Stott says this, the influence of Christians in and on society depends on their, dis on their being distinct, not identical. Here is something to wrestle with. I've spent dollars on studying the word. I've spent years in classrooms. I spent hours every week in God's word. I'm familiar with original languages, with the contextual culture, with translation theories. I can argue the meaning of various texts and critique others' interpretation of understanding. But here's the problem. With all that knowledge and time and study, we can still live lives that spread something all over the world that doesn't taste much like Jesus. In fact, we can live like the world around us while still having so much of the word in us. Don't forget that was one of Jesus' indictments on the Pharisees, was how much scripture they knew, but how, much, how little of God that they gave themselves to. John Stock goes on and says this, the world is going rotten and cannot stop itself from going bad. Only salt introduced from the outside can do that. But that can't happen if our distinctive from the outside is lost. We are not of this world, but we do live in this world. Because the kingdom to which we belong, we've been sent as ambassadors to represent here. This is not our home. My favorite I've got friends who have uh, lived around the world, grew up in other places around the world, uh, and, and now that we're friends, they introduce me to parts of their culture, mostly culinary, that I love, right? Uh, when someone says, hey, I got a, a, a good taco place that reminds me of when I grew up, I'm listening to that guy, right? <laughs> uh, I've got friends who uh, grew up in Germany, when they say, hey, there's this place on the north side, and they make some of the best, uh, you know, whatever, spatzel and whatever that you've ever, like, I, wa I want to go with that person. Why? Because they come with a different culture, and it adds something. You feel me? The world we live around needs a church who is fully aligned with a different kingdom to bring that kingdom into the world that we're in. If we lose our holiness of being set apart, what we bring in loses the impact of the salt that we're called to spread. We need to walk with Christ that transforms our heart of stone into a heart of flesh. We need to be holy as he is holy. Holy Spirit, would you have your way in our lives? Our distinction is dependent in holiness. 
Last one is this. We're called to live set apart and sent out. Both at the same time. Set apart and sent out. Not set apart and stayed put. Not set apart and separated from everybody. It's helpful to think, if you go back to the early monastic movement, meaning like the early monks, who wouldn't have called themselves monks, but that's how it ended up, were people who were serving in city centers. And they needed to get away from people to be with the Lord so they could be filled up by the Lord to go back into the people. See what I'm saying? Feels like Jesus, who separated himself to be with the Father and then came back to be with the people. The problem is they found out it's much easier to stay up in the mountains. It's easier to not deal with people. And instead of following Jesus' motion where he separates time to be with the Lord and then comes back to be with the people and this rhythm that ebbs and flows to be with the Lord and then coming to be with people and then going to be with the Lord and then coming back to be with people is if all you do is just go to be with the Lord and you isolate yourself, you won't be following him because he's going back to the people. And the salt often has lost its saltiness because we've isolated and removed ourselves and insulated ourselves so much that we don't know the world well enough to salt it. As Craig Blomberg says, we are called to permeate society as agents of redemption. How do we do that? As salt of the earth, we salt the earth. When we live the good life and are poor in spirit, those who mourn, when we are gentle and hunger and thirst for righteousness, and when we live in a loyal, promise-keeping kind of love, when we are pure in heart, when we are peacemakers, when we are then persecuted because of righteousness and people hurl insults of all kinds, those are the kinds of people who stand out and flavor the world around us. Church, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. Church, we can't lose our saltiness. The world around us needs Jesus. We have them, and we need to salt our neighborhoods. We need to salt our families. We need to salt our coworkers. We need to salt our friends with Jesus. Holiness is the place of our mission. What people need isn't someone who's just like them. They need someone who's just like him. And the more we're like Christ, the more we bring Christ into the world that doesn't have them and give them a glimpse that they may see the kingdom on earth, maybe a glimpse of what it could be in heaven. It's when we live for Christ in the darkness of our world around us that we can live and give glory to God and point everyone to the one whom saved our soul. John Stott says this, the world will undoubtedly persecute the church, yet it's the church's calling to serve the persecuting world. Is it going to? Jesus says yes. So what's our response? Love them. Serve them. Mourn over them. Show them what a pure in heart person looks like. Give them this uh, kind of hesed, this uh, lo loyal, promise-keeping kind of love, this mercy and this grace. Show them who Christ has been to you. Jesus is clear that people will push back, reject his ways, and even revolt against his kingdom, but we keep moving forward. This can all seem like an impossible journey and a way of life, which is why I think Jesus, in his call is to die to ourselves and to be resurrected because in and of ourselves goes back to the, with man, it's impossible. But it's through God that all things are possible. Sky Jatani comments this way, it isn't that he expected each person to change the world through remarkable accomplishments. So rest at ease. Rather, Jesus expected his undistinguished followers to be the source of the world's most essential ingredients. Pliny, who lived in the first century, commented that there is nothing more useful in the world than salt and sunshine. Likewise, in a dark, deteriorating world, there is nothing more wonderful than simple people living as Jesus taught. The world does not need more ambitious Christians. Our world desperately needs more ordinary lives lived in rich communion with God. Amen?
Our lives need to be characterized by Jesus. Right now, it's estimated there's about 31% of human population on planet Earth would identify as Christian, to which Dallas Willard, the late Dallas Willard, gave this reflection, shouldn't one third pound of salt have more of an effect on one pound of meat? So if the salt's already all over the earth, but it's not very salty, maybe we've started to lose our saltiness. The issue isn't how much more salt is needed. The question is, when will our salt actually be salty, adding flavor and value and preserving the world around us? I love one of my favorite books on evangelism. Was a book, uh, uh, it is a book by a, a, a lady by the name of Rebecca Pippert. She worked for uh, InterVarsity Campus Ministries, and it's called Out of the Salt Shaker. She says this, how can we be the salt of the earth if we never get out of the salt shaker? If we never love our neighbor, if we never try to build relationships, if we don't mourn over their sin enough that drives us towards it so that we can salt it so they can see Jesus. Thank God that Jesus put people around us. Would he use us to put those same people around others? We can choose isolation or insulation. In doing so, we choose comfort over our calling. We need non-Christian friendships. We need to get into the lives of the people around us. We need people to bless. God's calling of Abram in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. Right? In some sense, just follow me and I'll take you where you need to go, but you can't stay here. He says, and I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. God's plan from the beginning for his people was that he would be a blessing to us so that we could be a blessing to people. That the way that the world will be blessed or the earth would be blessed, is because of the blessing that God's people have received and how they give it away. You get it? But if you've read much of the Old Testament, sometimes the salt lost its saltiness. Or it just didn't even come out of the shaker to begin with. I have a friend who wrote a book using the acronym to talk about how some of the families on earth might be blessed through you. Maybe you want to take a screenshot So how do, I, how do I even start salting my neighborhood? I thought this was a really good acronym, so I just want to share it. B-L-E-S-S. Feels like we're supposed to be a blessing. This is a good way to start. B, think of the people around you, family, friends, neighbors, coworkers. Begin in prayer. God, would you, would you help me see what they're going through? Would you help me understand where the hurt's coming from? Would you help me understand why they're isolated or why they're angry? Would you help me see where the cracks are in their life that you are the answer to? Father, would you, would you show me what they need? God, would you build a connection? Would you draw us close? Would you build bridges? Father, would you give me opportunities? Would you uh, lead in a way that allows me to go to them? And Lord, would you give me something to say when we're around each other? We begin in prayer. The L is just to listen. And sometimes that's where we're not very good. We like to talk because we got a message, but do we listen, hear from them? What's going on with them? Where are they from? What's their story been? Do they have someone who's actually interested in their own life? Next, he says to eat. That's where he got me. I thought if there's an evangelism tool out there that involves the table, now we're friends, right? But the idea is this is to actually sit down over a meal and just just be together. You know the difference. There's people you've talked to on Sundays. There's been people you've sat down and had a meal with. There's something that happens in that spot. And then the next S, he goes, or the first S, he says, then find a way to serve them. Find a way uh, just to give them something, to be generous in some way. Find a way to show up for them and to uh, show them what it looks like. Why? Because we lead first, like Christ, in blessing them. We just want them to see we're salting them, right? This is the issue here. And then the last one is where uh, I've heard it story or share, but the idea is this. When we've, when we've already prayed for them, 
when we've listened to them, when we've shared a meal together, when we've had an opportunity to serve, it gives us the ability to share who Christ has been in us and how we've been transformed by him and how he may fit that need or that area of hurt or that area of want or, or that lordship piece that's missing in their life. We find where Jesus could show up. Now, it doesn't mean the whole process is on us. The spirit leads us through and does all the work. But if we're not praying and we're not listening and we're not inviting people to eat with us and we're not sharing and we're not serving and we're not speaking, you see where maybe the salt is losing its saltiness. Question is this, how are you salting the earth? Can you start by being a blessing to the people around you? Have you considered reaching out to someone younger than you to see if they'd like to grab coffee with you? I lost my place. Here we are. When is the last time you were able to share with someone who didn't know God all that God has done in your life? I've found this. I, there's people I've known for a long time. And I've known they were Christians. And I've known that they have a walk. And we've been close enough where I feel like there's details that I found out later that I should have known way back then. And here's the wild part is you start finding out where God was faithful here and then he was faithful there, and then he showed up in a wild way here, and when something tragic happened, God met them in a place, and all of a sudden, you find in this person this treasure that was sitting in there of God's work in their life, but they just never shared it. Church, that is our story oftentimes, that God has poured so much into this salt shaker that sometimes we just don't get it out there. We don't share it. Maybe you think it's awkward. Maybe you think it's weird. I would tell you, it's your calling. Will you pray asking God to give you someone to bless, someone to salt? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter, who walked with Jesus, we talked about this last week, who had his ups and downs in his own walk who abandoned Christ in many ways by the time the rooster crowed three times, who was restored back, who decades later is uh, ministering, serving, loving, caring, being salt to the world around him, writes this as a good reminder for us. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Oftentimes the issue is this. We, we have a Christian education. We have a church culture but we're missing a Lord, a Messiah, a King, who's Lord over our lives, who shapes how we think, who shapes how we react, who shapes our attitudes, who shapes when we're out of line, who gets us back in, who no matter what we think, we lay it bare and say, Father, it's not my will, but your will be done because you are Christ. You are Lord. You are over all and in all and through all. Have you set aside Christ in your hearts as Lord? My encouragement for us is to ask, is King Jesus separated in your heart from everything else? Does he have dominion, rule, and reign over your thinking, your actions, your attitudes, your responses, your interactions, and your decisions? Is he set apart as Lord in your heart, or are you or someone else still in that position? Sanctify him. Set him aside. As we take communion and move into that moment, uh, Ray and I have been talking a lot lately. Uh, I've realized that my memory for some things is incredible and my memory for other things is pretty terrible, right? I don't know if that's age. All those with gray or balding hair said amen. But here's what I know. I, I can remember, I, I like to think of it as like the who wants to be a millionaire stuff. I, I know the most pointless facts of things that bear no meaning or value. You know what I'm saying? Right? There's, there's, I, I know too much of too many things that don't matter, I guess is what I'm saying. I've got a memory for that. But then there's like things I've just realized recently um, that I, I don't have a great memory for past moments. 
It's hit me recently. I, I don't remember much. I, we're talking with our boys and other people and uh, even uh, just hearing Dick Ron give his testimony about having memories from like, f- f- uh, sorry, five years old, six years old. I don't remember almost anything before junior high. I don't think it's a condition. I'm just saying I don't have much memory of that. And what I also know is throughout life, uh, there, there's things that we forget, yeah? Things we can lose track of, things that we don't hold tight, things that uh, should matter that don't. I love, uh, we can go through our house and I'll pick up a spoon and Ray will say, your great aunt got that for us as a wedding gift. No idea. No idea. And then I'll say, uh, we have a joke at our house because Ray doesn't remember what year we graduated high school, right? Right? And so she remembers the spoon, but doesn't remember like the year we graduate. You know, so it's like all these things, our, our memory is really weird. It's weird how it works. But whether you've got a great memory or a bad memory, there's one true thing of all of humanity is we are prone to forget. And there's things throughout the Old Testament that God set apart as festivals and moments to make sure that God's people didn't forget moments and places where he intervened and spots where he showed up. Jesus, after walking with his disciples the night before he was betrayed, met with them and shared a meal. And at that meal, he broke bread and he passed around a cup saying, do this in remembrance of me. Church, we need to remember because it's too easy for us to forget. I think maybe the saltiness that we've lost in some ways has been because we've forgotten. Not that we don't know and we couldn't pass the test or the information's not up there, but it doesn't show up in our hearts and how we see people. It doesn't show up in the grace that we received that we are commanded to give away, in the forgiveness that we've been offered and commanded to forgive others, in the ways that we view the world and the people around us, the church that we're a part of in those same kinds of ways. And Jesus brings it all back and calls us that whenever or as often as we get together, that we would take this to remember him. So Jesus, on that night, opened up his cup. No, I'm kidding. But he grabbed the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, eat this in remembrance of me. What do we eat? And he lifted the cup and he gave thanks and said, this is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. And church, Paul reminds us later that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, We proclaim, we preach the Lord's death until he comes, that we live in the in-between, that he's died, risen, and ascended, but that he's coming again. And until then, would we remember who we are? Would we remember who Christ is? Would we remember what he's done so that it shapes who we are? who we're becoming, and what we're doing as we follow Christ towards eternity. Would you stand and pray? Lord Jesus, we ask Father, would we hear the words that Jesus preached? Not in an information sense, but in a transformation sense. Not just that the, uh, the sounds of the words went into our ears. There's an understanding of the teaching. We get the concepts. Father, would you break through the soil of our heart to plant that seed in there? That we are called to be the salt of the earth. That is who we are. And Father, as we hear Jesus asking, it causes us just to reflect. What happens when we lose our saltiness? How can we be made salty again? 
Father, would you hear us as we repent from when we've lost our saltiness? And Father, would we receive from you what you've given us, continue to give us, show up lavishing it all over us, this love, this redemption, this forgiveness that's in Christ. And Father, would that spur us forward in the new life we've given, that like Paul says, we are regularly taking off our old selves and putting on the new, that we put to death the old life so that we can fully live into the new one, that this salt is not just who we are, but it's what we give. That the world around us that so often is too easy to complain about from our nest. Father, would you kick us out of the nest so that we would come and be the people you've called us to be, to the people you've called us to be around, so that we could see the world around us having more and more experience and exposure by your spirit to the goodness of the kingdom of God through our lives. Father, you've been so good we do live in a living hope through the resurrection. So Father, would that living hope come out in the message we give, in the words that we have, in the life that we live to the people around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.